So I put this quote up on the uh, easel. Uh, resilient family is both a system that has adapted well to the chronic stress associated with a child's, uh, this says disability, but I just think of it as child's illness needs, as well as a mediator or cause of the child's psychosocial development or resilience. What the heck does all that mean? But what I think it means is that the resilient family is a system, okay, so there's a lot of members of the family, and that it helps um, not only you all to survive within a system where there's a child with chronic illness, but it also helps um, the child themselves. So that's my interpretation of this. So not only are we looking at coping skills, but we're looking at what, is it, what does it take to become um, better adept. Oh, perfect. Thank you. We have pads of paper. If you need some paper, please raise your hand. We, I now have, I'm going to ask you to do a couple of little writing exercises. So having some paper helps. My name is Suzanne Edison. I'm um, the mom of a child with dermatomyositis, and she is 16 currently. Um, she has been, she was diagnosed at six, so we've been um, involved with CureJM for 10 years, and I've been, um, I'm the International Family Support Director. I've been another uh, chapter support, for, I'm chapter support for Washington State. I'm from Seattle, and um, I'm also on the research committee currently and leadership council. So pretty actively involved with CureJM. And um, my daughter has uh, flared uh, twice. Well, she had her original and then flared and now has been in remission for two years. So we feel very grateful to CureJM for additional lots of information. We've traveled to doctors in Chicago as well as have great doctors in Seattle. Um, and I started this workshop at Seattle Children's many years ago, a support group for parents who had kids with dermatomyositis because there really was nothing, particularly for um, kids with parents who have kids with all kinds of orphan diseases, chronic illnesses, um, there's really very little. And I started this workshop here at the conference probably eight years ago, and it's morphed a little bit. And I do a lot of writing now with parents, and I have writing workshops at Children's and um, outside of Children's as well. And I've also done writing workshops for teens who have kids with chronic, who are kids with chronic illness. Um, and the reason I've moved to writing, I have, uh, I'm a poet and a writer, and I also have a background as a psychotherapist. Um, I believe that, write, well, writing for me was my survival. And when my daughter was really ill the first time. So I, I found that was a way for me to be able to process my feelings, to move towards thinking, and to have better capacity for action. And um, I've been since, I've been doing a lot of research on the brain, and we can talk about that. What I wanted to do uh, first was kind of give you an overview of what we're gonna do today. So we've done a little introduction for me, and, um, we're going to look at some of the major stresses in your life, both yours, your family, your child. We're going to do an overview of grief, loss, and trauma. Um, now that there are a few more people, we might do small group breakout. And I'll give you some questions to think about in those small groups. We'll return to the big group, and then we'll have this closing check-in. Okay? Um, what I'd like you to do first, before we do names and things like that, is to just uh, close your eyes if you feel comfortable. Um, get in a comfortable position in your chair. If you just want to look down in your lap, that's fine. Um, this is how I like to start every group, and I also end every group. is an, just an opportunity for us to take a little bit of um, our own temperature, as it were. I call it a mindfulness minute. And um, to just begin to notice your breath. Um, there's, you're probably coming here with lots of different feelings and thoughts and questions and concerns, and this is just a moment to notice what some of those might be, and to notice how you're feeling, where in your body do you notice that feeling, where is it easy to breathe, and where is it more difficult.
You're probably coming with some hopes and some fears for this weekend workshop. And I'd like you to think about what you want to get from this, this particular workshop. What would be, you know, if you walked out of this room, what is the one thing that you really want to have happen for you today? And if you could have, you know, use maybe three words or images to describe what it is you're feeling, experiencing, I'd like you to write those down, as well as your hopes and fears, and the one thing that you want to get from today. So three words or images that kind of describe how you feel right now, what your hopes and fears are, and one thing that you would really like to come away with from today. Does anyone need another pad of paper? Or Also, feel free to get up and get refreshments at any point in time. Would anyone like to share one of these hopes or fears or something else that came to you to start us off? Anyone? Okay. Okay. Anyone else? So what the long-term prospects are and the course of treatment, okay. So lack, would that be lack of knowledge, would you say? You not being taken seriously.
Does that work? Not being taken seriously. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Okay. If you just came in, we're, um, we had a moment to kind of reflect on what our hopes and fears are um, coming to the workshop and also um, what you might want to get out of today. Yeah. Anything else? Okay, that's fine. So let's talk a little bit about what the major stresses are in your lives. Your life, your child's life, <laughs> the rest of your family. Just you can throw those out there. Start with it. I'll just, I'll just go around the room and see if you have one thing, any one thing that you would like to add, a major stress. Okay. Just being around other kids because they're so busy and stressed that you know, Chase is very good at someone coughing and he's like up and out of there. Okay, so d disease flare uh, and other health concerns. Okay. 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 Sibling reactions. Okay. Do you have? Major. Mm -hmm. So your lack of c close connection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Lack of close physical distance. Okay. So we can talk at some point about things you might be able to do from distance, too. Um, I think so mental trauma of, for the child. Okay. Family stress. Family meaning large extended family or sibling connections? How to manage the family, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Until they have to get out. In the back? Okay. Are you close by with? Yes. Okay. So, peer responses. Mm -hmm. Teens. In the back.
Okay. Great. And I know you joined us a little late, but what I'm asking is, um, we started with some hopes and fears. Now I'm asking for what some of the major stresses are in your lives, either your life, your child's life, the whole family, if you have anything to add to this. So educating family about the severity of the disease. I think there's another sibling workshop, by the way, in a different time zone, time slot. <laughs> Not an alternate reality, but. Um, okay, that's, this is a good start. I don't think we need to, I think we have quite a bit to focus on. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about, um, let's go backwards. about trauma and grief and loss and moving to resilience, accommodation, acceptance. So one of the things that I began to realize as a parent was that, um, I mean, not only was I going through grief and frustration and anger, uh, it wasn't just one time, it came up again and again, and there are these different layers of it. I mean, it's something that uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talked a lot about in stages of death and dying. So uh, for a long time, I, I sort of used that as a model of all these stages, but you never move from really one stage to the next to the next in some linear form. You kind of repeat and you come back at different times and different layers. So that was a piece that I really began to understand early on. And then it began, I began to realize that um, I was having sort of a PTSD response that if her blood work went up or her, she wasn't feeling well one day and, and there would be all these little triggers for my panic attacks <laughs> or my anxiety to rise. And so I started doing some research about trauma and the brain and feeling. And there is some documentation and research for um, PTSD in parents of kids with uh, cancer, but there hasn't been a lot of research done on parents of kids with chronic illness. There is some. There's resources on my website. Uh, for those of you who weren't here early, I have um, a connection for my website that you can look at. There's a resources page there. And there is some research out there. And I, I highly recommend reading it because for me, it, anyway, it gave me a sense of like, oh, I'm not crazy. Um, there, there really are these chemical changes in the brain and in the body that happen from a, a traumatic experience, which I consider having a chronic child chronic illness of a child is a traumatic experience. So um, what happens through that? Well, you have this loss of regulation. It's really hard to regulate your emotions. It's really hard to regulate your thinking if you're overwhelmed by your feelings. And then it becomes harder to follow and follow through on treatment, to be able to advocate for your child, to be able to think clearly about what the um, next steps should be or what you could do to be helpful. So how do we deal with that? How, and, and I think that's, you know, I think we all have coping mechanisms. Some of them work better than others. And I think that'll be an, op uh, today will be an opportunity for us to share those with each other. Um, some of the emotions people have brought up already, some of the things that we go through as parents, I think initially a diagnosis gives us a sense of shock. For me, also, it was a sense of relief. I knew there was something wrong. I didn't understand yet how long the course or the side effects of treatment or how it was gonna be a lifelong thing. I was just glad she wasn't gonna die. Okay. And that, that somebody knew what this was. And that there were some treatments available. So shock, then anger, guilt. Um, I didn't put fear in there, but it's certainly in there. 
Um, guilt is a hard one, I think, for a lot of people. Um, did I do something wrong? Was it my fault? How can I help? Um, I don't think guilt is very useful, but I think we have it. So finding a way to move through that. Um, denial. Oh, no, this is, this, she'll be done with this in a year. You know, um, it, we actually were told two years. And the first time she was sick, that wasn't true. It was almost five years before she would go into remission. Many kids, I think the understanding of has evolved over the last 10 years. We know that probably 20% will actually go into remission at this point. So there is, it's a lifelong illness. Some people go through bargaining. You know, if, I'm, if I go to church enough, if I'm you know, good enough, if so-and-so is, you know, if this works out, then she's going to get well. Um, Many parents, and maybe even grandparents, have sense of depression. I know um, when you're exhausted and your adrenals are just shot, um, some days it's very hard to think about, how do I get out of bed? And, and I still have all these, I have other kids I have to pay attention to. I may have a job, a uh, partner. Uh, things become m way more difficult. And then I think sometimes, eventually, many of us move to, well, what really is important? What do I really need to be doing in my life right now? What's really important for, for my child, for my family, for myself? And the one thing I will add that I think is very difficult for primary caretakers is to take care of themselves. I know for a fact that if the well is dry, there is no way that you're going to be useful to your child. So as why we always want to put our kids first. I'm, I'm always advocating for save a little time for yourself because in the long run it helps everybody. Okay. Again, it's cyclical, doesn't happen just once. None of these feelings um, are a one-time event. I, I used the word acceptance uh, in a group recently particularly with some parents who have kids who are on the autism spectrum. And I know for a lot of kids, there are, there are not just one, JDM is not the only disease. Sometimes there are overlaps, sometimes there's autism, sometimes there's celiac. Other issues can be a part of um, their illness. And so there's a sense of, well, I may not accept this, but I'm going to accommodating to it. You know, we have a new normal and I'm going to accommodate to it. And I think that that's an important place eventually to get to. And, it does, again, you may not stay there all the time. You may cycle back into other feelings, and, but remembering that, oh, yeah, I was there once. I can probably get back there again. Um, sometimes anger is very useful. I'm thinking about your... Some, I think it moves us to action if we aren't stuck in it. You know, I think it can be a real, you know, like, I'm angry. I'm going to go up, figure out how I can make this better. I know that was my... And also, for those of us who felt... Um, helpless, moving into action, joining CureJM, raising money became an, an out, something that we could do when we really couldn't do anything other than be with our kids. Um, a little bit about resilience, and um, but before we get to that, uh, I just want to check in with people and see if there's anything else that has come up for you while we've been talking a little bit about this, about grief, loss, trauma. Yeah. Her, almost her whole life, yeah. Strong for your child. Mm -hmm. And so I never really had that opportunity to just be alone and just kind of, you know, um, I guess I just really experienced my emotions at that moment. And so I didn't get to really feel those emotions until I was finally addressing what actually happened because I just started to be this is what's happening and started going through the 
Right. I think you point out a really good thing that we all have fantasies as parents, grandparents, how we're going to be in the world with our kids and having a kid with chronic illness really changes that and and it is a loss, it's a death. We have to re redefine who we are, who we are as a family, who my child is, what do I appreciate about who they are now and allow yourself to have those feelings. So I'm really glad you brought that up. I sometimes think family therapy is really important. I know that we've done that for our, with our family. And um, sometimes just my child would have therapy and then parents would go. And I had to learn how to parent differently. I mean, I, I, I only have one child, so I didn't know, oh, this is this normal or is this the disease or, you know, what's going on? So I think there's a lot to be learned. Yeah. I'm sorry I didn't put envy on that list, but thank you that it's there. And I just wrote a piece about it, a blog piece, so if you can go on my website and look at it. I think it's a very hard emotion to deal with. Um, nobody likes to be envious. Nobody likes to feel those feelings, and it's really hard when it's envy of fam another family or another child's wellness neurotypically developing. Um, so thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Yeah. I can give you a minute and we can, um, I can come back to you, or do you want to try again? I think that's a process that How do you help them with that? That's a wonderful question. I don't think there's any one answer. I think that, you know, she will have to go through her own grieving process. And I think for me, the best thing is for you to be able to be there with her and to reassure her. I mean, I don't know how long she's been in treatment, but she could get better and could get stronger and be able to play. Not that she'll go to the Air Force, but she could be able to potentially Mm -hmm. 
I hope that she will connect with other teenagers because I think that's a really important piece. There are lots of kids who've gone through that. My daughter's 16. She's been sick much longer, but um, many other kids who got sick in their teens and now in their early 20s. So there's quite a bit of uh, movement and I think also lots of better treatments, but it will take time. It's, it's potential she can play basketball again. Um, I, I won't say for sure because I don't know her. That's great. That's great. So that's... Yeah. Is she here this weekend? Well, I hope she will connect with some of the other teens. I think that'll be... Is she in the workshop now? Great. That's great. I think it'd be really important for us to get into small groups at this point. I'm going to ask you some questions. And perhaps um, mixing it up with parents and grandparents rather than all grandparents and great-grandparents together might be useful because I think you guys can help each other learn from each other. So um, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, thirteen. Uh, let's do four groups of three and one group of four. <laughs> And one group with four of them. So um, find three people that you don't know. So if you're sitting with a partner, mix up your group. And just find a, a little space in the room, and then I'll give you sort of the next. <laughs> you, can, you can pull your chairs into a little circle. You could move over into the corner so you can hear better. Okay, you can have another group of, a group of four, yeah. Okay, that's great, okay. <laughs> All right, here's a couple of questions I want you to think about. And you might wanna write them down. Just, if you, does anyone need a pad of paper? I think there's some, okay, there's some pads back here. Okay, pads and paper, uh, pens. Okay, first I want you to just introduce yourselves, um, to get, you know, tell your name, where you're from, child, grandchild, great-grandchild, um, what their name is, how long they've been in diagnosis or in treatment, or since diagnosis, I should, I should say. Um, and then, uh, so three things I want you to talk about is, what do coping and resilience mean to you? I think we've gotten down some of the concerns, but what's the one thing that concerns you most right now? And what helps you deal with this illness and with caretaking? So I think you probably already have some skills, something that you do that helps you cope. And what's one thing that you do that is really, you find good in caretaking? I'm gonna give you 25 minutes. And then we'll come back together as a group, okay? I'm gonna kind of circle around and just eavesdrop and see if there's anything that I you know, wanna pull out and talk about later.
I know that this is everybody's favorite part of this workshop, <laughs> particularly if you come from places where there's nobody else to talk to. So it's really hard to stop. Maybe you can find a way to come back close in again so we can uh, sort of share some of the feedback and ideas that have come up in your small groups. A quick uh, reminder for those who weren't here in the beginning. Um, thank you so much. I have a website. I have a website and I have resources on the website for reading, more materials. I keep a blog, um, announcements. Here's um, uh, uh, my business card so you can find me online. You can send me questions, whatever you want. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I, when, I first, when my daughter was first diagnosed, I, called, I, I was desperate for somebody to talk to. And then, well, this was 10 years ago. And um, I live in Seattle, and I kept saying, where are the people? I know you have other families. Oh, we can't give it out because it's privacy issues. And finally, I cross-referenced a couple of lists, and I found one person, and she was my lifeline. And I would call her and just in tears, and I'd say, tell me I'm not crazy. And she'd say, you're not crazy. I called Michelle Bassett. Yeah. <laughs> okay. like, yeah. She's great. She's definitely, yeah. I'm sure, more than just, you know. <laughs> so let's, let's talk a little bit about things that you've maybe talked about in your small groups that help help when um, help you cope and also help you as a caretaker for others what have you found out what have you discovered what did you hear new maybe I wrote a few things down because I just wanted to get it going so I said because I heard this from somebody else's group um, educational materials sending those written materials to family members extended family members it is, is at least a start they may not understand it all but at least that's a start um, we know that meeting with others with the same disease, so coming to these workshops, conferences, if you have, we're starting chapters, so I think that's going to become more prevalent within states um, eventually. I wrote this down because I, I know lots of my friends just did not know what to do. Family were a little bit better, but the, I had a lot of friends who were just like, I don't even know what to do, and so they would disappear or you know, they would feel terrible because they wanted to do something and I would, so I'd say, well, just ask me what you can do to be helpful. <laughs> I mean, I didn't even know for a long time how much I needed. You know, I was just in do mode, right? And then as parents and ask for what you need, please ask because nobody can read your mind as much as we think our kids like to believe that we can read their minds, but truth is we can't, right? So other things, what came, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. Uh-huh. 
I know that that's really true in the beginning, and sometimes it gets really hard when you're out five years, and you're out ten years, and people, you feel like, I can't keep asking for these things. But you, you, Right. And oftentimes at those, because oftentimes at those summer camps, there's workshops like this for parents. So the kids get. do some of the same things. Even if it's just for a day. I mean, try eating their diet for a day or, <laughs> or hang out with them for a day. I had a friend come from Portland. We live in Seattle and she hung out with us for a weekend and she, at the end of the weekend she said, I had no idea what you had to do on a daily basis. I mean, just being in the house, seeing all the medications, you know, seeing how we had to manage different things. I mean, that was like a big eye opener. So even if they come and hang out for two hours with you. Okay, other things. to family, oftentimes, uh-huh. <laughs> mentioned some things about balance before. What are the, some of the things that you do as a family or could do with a family to help create balance? I know for particularly for families that have multiple kids, one who's sick and one who or one or more who aren't, how do you manage, you know, those kinds of situations? Yes.
to the one who's sick. Good. Yeah. Right. So making sure everybody gets their special moments. Uh, yeah. yeah, so that was my next question, was for those of you who have partners, and for those of you who don't have partners, how do you get time for yourselves? And do you get time for yourselves? <laughs> <laughs> so having grand or other parents helps. Yeah. Grandparents, great grandparents, did you f learn anything new and or was something that struck you about this time that you thought, oh, I could try that? <laughs> she meeting Ashley? No, I or Michelle? Michelle. So you might be able to help with that in some way. That's great. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So finding out more what you can do specifically, that's great. Anyone else? In the Thank you. That's great. I mean, there are some kids in New Mexico, but it's it's harder. Yeah. I don't think you hear about it until you have somebody in your family who has it. I have, I've never heard of it ever in my life, but I couldn't even pronounce it when I was first thrown at it. <laughs> I thought I was the only one. And in the back again. Did 
take them with you. Mm -hmm. and, but there's a lot of sun. So how can you help? You, oh, you canceled the trip. Uh, there are some ways. Uh, yeah. Well, I think there's actually quite a few things that you can learn from the sun exposure workshop because we've done trips to Hawaii and we just make sure that we're only on the beach from 4 to 6 or 9 to 10 in the morning. Even in Florida, we have local sun and there are ways to manage. We've got big brim hats, long yep. sleeves, you know, UV protected clothes. They have actual UV protected clothes, not just like school suits, but Columbia sells a line that are completely, you know, UV protected and they're thin and breathable and sunblock. And there's stuff that you can wash into the clothes. Yes, there's that, yep. And, and umbrellas, I mean, there's ways to manage it without having yep. to. Yeah. Okay, any one last comment that you just feel like it's, it's important to get out before we do our last closing? Yeah. Don't let yourself get to the point where you have care for people. Because once you hit bottom with yourself, I have done it before, and once you get there, it's hard to pick yourself back up. Keeping yourself, your me time, as you've talked about, is very, very important. Because if you're not well, you can't take care of anybody. And sometimes for me it was just, I need a half an hour to go for a walk, yes, you know. <laughs> that was not really relaxing for me, but, <laughs> no, but it's, it's so sometimes. <laughs> it's true. Donuts, so. so whatever it is that you can find to do for yourselves, I think is really important. And, and also with grandparents and friends. I mean, I had a friend say, can I come over and I'll just sit at the, this was when my daughter would be asleep she said I'll stay here for two hours and you and your husband can go out and have dinner you know that was remarkable but like once she was down we could actually instead of just crashing in front of the TV you know, go out and do something or just go for a walk even All right, I'm gonna ask you to come back to your seats where you were to begin with or where you are now actually and um, we're gonna do a little bit of the self check-in that we started with for those of you who were here in the very beginning so just find a, make yourself comfortable in this seat that you've been in for the last hour and a half. And if you want to close your eyes, feel free to do that or just um, allow them to drop down and begin to notice for yourself what, if anything, feels different to you than when you first started. Notice your breath. Does it feel easier, different? the same. Where in your body do you feel most alive right now? And if there's one word or two words that come to you about today. Um, check in to see if you got what you were hoping for from this workshop. And it's okay if you didn't. And just take a minute then to write down any thoughts or feelings or phrases that come to you um, just as a way of kind of bringing closure to this time. We have a little time um, before the end of the workshop and before the next one 
uh, is starting in this room. So if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. Or if you just want to hang out and talk to each other for a while, you can do that too. But let me just see if there's anything else that you want to say about today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your participation. Did anyone, everyone hear that? So being able to talk to classmates and a child life person can often come from a local hospital. I mean, I did it for my kid, but <laughs> right. Thank you all so much for your participation. I really appreciate it. Feel free to take a business card and hope I'll see you around. Okay.